Greetings, everyone. This is Brett Benjamin. I have the pleasure of serving for UUP in this round of negotiations as the chief negotiator. I'm going to walk through some material, uh, give you a little bit of a sense of where we are in our in our negotiations process. I have um, worked with our team to post some PDFs that give you quick summaries and, and overviews of, of the material in this presentation. But for those of you who wanted a little bit more detail, we thought we would give a chance to see some additional data and hear a little bit more about some of the proposals that we've um, that we're, we've uh, been talking about that have risen to the top. So we've we've uh, recorded this this session to give uh, members some a, additional uh, depth of, of understanding where we are. So. Um, we are at the process of uh, a transition. We have been spending the fall semester, basically from September through um, uh, December, um, trying to gather feedback from our membership, and, and, and it's been great. We've had a really impressive round of engagements with members from all over the state. As you know, we did a member survey. Um, we had a really good response. Uh, we had 11,638 people who returned that survey. That's fantastic. That's over 31% of our total bargaining unit. Um, really strong feedback. We had 58 different town hall sessions over the last few months where we, um, where we talked to campuses. We did regional meetings. We did constituent group meetings of various kinds. We, we met with statewide committees all to get as, as full an understanding of members' needs as possible. I think that was a, a, a really important um, and valuable set of feedback that all of you have given in those sessions. And so we thank you for that. We've had an, an email address that's open, contract at uupmail.org. It remains open. You all have sent me hundreds of messages there, and I really appreciate that feedback as well. And we've had input from our chapters. Each chapter has representatives on negotiations and ad hoc committees. So that means there are three reps from every chapter. Those chapter reps have um, submitted reports about the, the issues that are most pressing on individual campuses. And those reports have been really valuable. We met with our negotiations and ad hoc committees in early February. Um, went through all this data that we're going to talk about in the in the presentation here um, and worked with them to really identify some key priorities incredibly helpful to have ongoing input from the campuses um, we're not done yet uh, we're still gathering feedback we we are absolutely getting um, extensive feedback from our labor relations staff they they know the contract inside and out work on its details and we get great feedback from them we always um, collect an enormous amount of data from UUP, from our own um, internal data, but then part of the um, bargaining process is that we can submit a Taylor Law request to the state and we're gonna get extensive data from the state as, as we do our negotiations preparations that really informs a lot of our proposals. Our statewide union committees have given um, reports on negotiations priorities, extremely helpful. Uh, our statewide officers and some of the past chief negotiators have given us feedback. Again, real um, insights from people who've been through this process before. And of course, want to make sure that our lines of communication with all of our members are still open. Um, we want you to be sending us uh, feedback to that um, contract at uupmail.org address. And then we also want to urge everybody to be working with their chapters um, to be continually organizing and, and, and uh, engaging around contract questions. And as issues come up, you know, talk to the people who are the reps on your negotiations and ad hoc committees from, from your campus, from your chapter. Let them know what's going on and make sure that information is getting up to us. Before we get into the feedback itself, I think it's really important to understand the diversity of UUP's bargaining unit. Um, we have about 42,000 members total. Uh, about 5,000 of those are retirees. They, they make enormous contributions to our union, but um, we can't represent them at the table. We can only bargain for active members who are on state payroll. So that membership is about 37,000. Um, and as you see here, it splits pretty evenly between academics and professionals. We've got 53% of our unit is academics, 47% are professionals. Just over a third of our unit are um, in the hospitals and health science centers. So 36% of our unit works there um, at, at our hospital and health science centers. 
um, you can see the rough splits here. And, and I think it begins to give you a sense of the diversity. Remember, when we go to the contract table, we're bargaining one contract for all 37,000 members. That's 29 different campuses, um, 32 chapters. We represent hospital and health science centers, as I said. We represent uh, university centers, comprehensives, tech uh, sector campuses, um, a, an enormous array of jobs on every one of those campuses. Uh, and so, you know, the challenge here is to think about a contract that works for everybody that that's close to a wall to wall union, the, the largest higher ed union in, in the nation. Um, and that that's able to address the specific needs of, of our members. Um, one of the key questions that we're always going to be wrestling with in any round of bargaining is, is around contingency. And so when we look at the overall unit, get a sense of, of um, the breakdowns here, 61% of our unit overall are on tenure line positions. 39% are contingent. This is a big number, but it's even bigger when you look at that um, ratio for the instructional faculty on our non-HSC campuses, on our non-health center science campuses. Um, there, it's about a 50-50, it's exactly a 50-50 breakdown. 50% 50 of our instructional faculty at the non-HSC campuses are on tenure line positions, 50% are contingents. Of those contingents, the largest group by far are the part-time lecturers, adjuncts. Um, that's nearly 40% of the unit, 30, 38%. And we also have a number of non-tenure track full-time um, faculty, either in lecturer lines, visiting lines, clinical research, and so forth, right? These have different needs, but they're, um, they're uh, put together by the fact that they have no pathway to permanency. Here's the look on our health science center campuses. This is academics on the health science center campuses. Here we see that only less than 20% of our health science center academics are tenure line. Um, the largest portion are clinical faculty, that's, that's largely doctors. Um, we also have a very big number of medical residents and fellows. Uh, about a third of, of the academics on our health science center campuses are, are residents or fellows. Um, and then a small number of people who are part-time adjuncts, lecturers, research faculty, and, and the like. We know we have a considerable problem in particular on some of our health science centers with temp appointments and, and what we consider to be abuse of temp lines. Um, and those are contingent uh, employees and, and it's something we take into account when we're, um, when we're developing proposals, uh, but, but a particular set of issues there. Here's a look at our professionals. You'll recall that um, uh, in UUP, our, our professional staff and faculty um, have the ability to achieve permanency. And so the, the vast majority of our professionals are tenure line employees, 83%. We have about 12% of our professionals who are part-timers. We have a few different um, groups of employees who are in appendix A, B, or C titles. Those have been excluded from, from permanency um, and some other positions as, as well. So, so take those into account as we think about our contingent workforce as well. When I did the town hall presentations, I told you that going into this round, we knew we had a few key priorities. We knew we were gonna be pushing for fair and equitable salary increases on base for all of our members, absolutely. We knew we wanted to make continued gains for contingent faculty. We wanted salary increases that were tied to longevity rather than discretion. Um, we wanted to achieve a long-term telecommuting arrangement. Um, we know that our hospitals have a particular set of issues that they have been facing and our health science centers over the last few years. And so we have to make some gains for our hospital um, and, and HSC employees. And then health benefits are always a, a key point at the table. And so making sure that we ensure um, eligibility, affordability, and quality of care for our health um, coverages is uh, a key priority. We knew all these going in. And so we've been asking our members about, um, you know, what what the priorities were for all of you, um, where where our members line up in relationship to those stated priorities, and and uh, you know I want to start by looking at the places where we have broad and clear consensus across the whole unit. The first and most obvious of those places is around salary increases, right? 74% um, of our members, this is in the survey, 
um, listed across the board salary increases on base as uh, a first or a second choice. That, that is by far the largest place of, of almost unanimity in, in the survey data. Um, and, and the other 26% put it as, as third or fourth. Um, we have to get uh, salary increases, absolutely. And our members made it crystal clear in the town halls, in their survey responses, that keeping up with rising inflation, the cost of living um, increases that people have seen, the uh, consumer price index, um, making sure that our, that our salary raises uh, are attentive to those costs of living is gonna be essential. So uh, 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 across the board priority. A second area of clear consensus is about minimizing the increases in health benefits costs. So, so we really wanna make sure that, um, that the benefits we have are of, of available to everybody, that they're, that they're quality, but, but people are of course concerned about the um, rising costs of, of benefits. And so among the non-salary priorities, this was um, the clear uh, top choice of, of members, keeping those benefit check costs in check. Um, and there wasn't a, there wasn't a close second. This this is obviously the um, the emphasis. While I'm talking about health benefits, a number of other um, uh, key questions it, ar arose in the member data. Um, people want to make sure that the existing range of services are still covered, and they want to expand that coverage. In particular, we heard a lot of response around mental health, around things like hearing aids, around long term disability. So so we know we want to keep that. Um, keep or extend that range of service. Um, we know that people want to make sure that the employee share of premium is absolutely kept uh, where it is. Nobody wants um, a, a rise in the employee share of, of premium. So that's going to be a priority. And then in particular, you know, again, we see the costs, uh, minimizing increases in, in co-pays for in-network care and prescription drugs. Uh, of the various health benefits priorities, that was the one that got the strongest support from, from membership. So we're gonna be attentive to that. Uh, longevity was an important uh, issue. Um, it, you know, moving away wherever possible from the DSI system, although we know we have a lot of members who appreciate DSI and, and I understand why it works in some places, but overall, um, you know, the union is bargaining money and then handing it to management to distribute at their discretion. And that, that discretion causes a lot of unevenness. It causes a lot of corrosive um, uh, you know, competition among, among people. And, um, and there's a sense of, of a lack of fairness. Um, so we're absolutely interested in, in considering a range of longevity options, steps, um, longevity awards, service awards of various kinds. And you'll recall that in the last uh, agreement, we, we put in a process for remediating salary compression. We wanted to know how that was working out. And we heard a lot of important critiques and valuable suggestions about ways in which the process in which the salary remediation was accomplished um, needs some work. So, so we know that there's um, some, some key places that we can do better if we're going to put this back in the, in the contract again. But it, we, were, we were interested to note that 84%, more than, four, more than four out of five of our members thought that um, remediating salary compression in the next contract was either very important or somewhat or moderately important. That's a pretty high figure. Um, it, it shows the ways in which salary compression is felt as a real problem in our unit. And so this gives us um, some important insights into, into the need to continue with that process, even as we know we need to make some, um, some uh, improvements in the ways it was rolled out. Um, and, and also as we see it in relationship to the other forms of longevity, again, steps, longevity awards, service awards, and so forth. That's gonna be something that we're gonna spend a lot of time trying to think about how we can make some of those um, uh, uh, gains in this round of, of negotiations so that members can expect regular salary increments over, their, over the course of their career. They can have a predictable sense of their, of their salary escalating to keep up with, uh, with cost of living. Beyond these couple things, though, um, what we see in the member data is that we don't have overall consensus about issues, but rather what we have is a set of 
of high priority concerns for particular portions of our membership. Remember what I told you about the diversity of our unit. Um, we have, you know, salary and health benefits cross everybody, but for professionals, there are a set of issues. For academics, there are a set of issues. For our health science center uh, employees, there are a set of issues. For our contingents, there are a set of issues. And each of these are absolutely high priorities for particular subsets. They may not be high priorities for the entire unit because they don't affect the entire unit. Um, so what we need to work towards, and the message that I'm going to be driving home in this presentation is that we're taking this member feedback and we're trying to find ways which we can use it to begin to imagine what a balanced agreement is going to look like, how we can work for everybody, but that means meeting the specific individual needs of portions of our bargaining unit. Um, that's going to be important. We need to see the forest and the trees in this process. So, for instance, on compensation, which we know is important for everybody, we, we also realize that, um, that different portions of our unit want to see it distributed in different ways, right? Um, the, the largest, we asked about how, how members would like to see that distributed. And the largest share of our employees, um, you know, pointed to the ways in which it's typically been distributed in our unit, which is the same percentage increase on base where everybody receives the same percentage increase, um, and, and that that has uh, proportionately greater benefit for people at the higher levels of salary. That, that makes sense. This is the way our unit has often done it. We have a number of people at a higher salary. Um, but we also want to note that um, compensation for longevity got a lot of um, support. Um, uh, lump sum payments of sorts, which, which proportionately benefit lower salary levels more. That also got strong support. Um, and then DSI uh, gets, some, gets some support too, in part because this is the way that our, our members have been used to getting that on base um, additional money. It works, as I said before, in some units. Some units do it really well. Um, and so there's, there's um, some interest in, in continuing with, with DSI for portions of our unit. Um, th this, of course, is going to be determined in part by wh who's benefiting from the different um, methods of distributing compensation. So, for instance, let's look at um, lump sum increases on base. Um, this benefits people at the lower end of the salary level. And so it's not surprising that part time and full time contingents overwhelmingly want to see that um, that money distributed as as a lump sum. Right. That, that makes perfect sense. On the other hand. Um, a, a percentage increase to base benefits people at a higher salary. And so that has more purchase for tenure track, tenured um, faculty uh, that, you know, that's important. I want to note, though, that here we begin to see it a little bit. And we're going to see this throughout that that um, one of the interesting things, this is this is just a breakdown of academics on our non health science center campuses. I wanted to just give you this illustration of um, the ways in which different portions of our unit like different um, aspects, different, different methods of, of distributing compensation. Um, uh, we're going to begin to see interesting um, forms of alliance and connection between tenure line faculty on the on the non HSC academic campuses and our contingent faculty. And we begin to see this a little bit here. Um, for instance, 58% of the tenure track faculty suggest um, lump sum increases on base. That's in part because they're early in their career, likely to have um, salaries that are not as high as before. But I think it also also points to an awareness of contingent faculty and the concerns that our contingent faculty have. Speaking of contingents, um, we know we want to make gains for our contingent faculty. This is essential. Um, we were really pleased in the last round to uh, finally achieve a per course minimum salary. It's not enough. We know it needs to be expanded, absolutely. Um, but we got it in the contract. It had been decades of fighting for it. And so when, when we were asking about that as a priority, not surprisingly, the people whom it affects most, part-time contingent faculty, overwhelmingly support increasing per course minimum of uh, salary as a top priority, right? 91% of part-time contingents um, consider it a uh, first or second choice. Um, we heard strong vocal support from this in, um, in the town halls. There is strong support in the surveys and the comments and so forth. Absolutely. Here again, I want to note that um, among full-time contingents, among tenured and tenure-track faculty members, 
um, increasing part-time minimum has become a, a majority of, of, of the faculty in those groups um, are considering that a top priority. I think that's really important. That's not necessarily the, um, the feeling we had a few decades ago when part-time uh, contingents felt like they were, they were absolutely um, not in alignment with tenure line faculty on a lot of issues. Increasingly, our member survey data and our town hall visits showed us that tenure line faculty um, have come to realize that their own sense of their academic work, their disciplines, their own workloads, um, the future of the university has been undermined by the crisis of contingency. And so increasingly tenure line faculty and, and full-time contingents um, certainly as well um, have, have become staunch advocates for, uh, for part-time contingent academic faculty throughout. <clears throat> we asked a few more contingent questions and, and these are, these are uh, helpful. Um, we asked our part-time academic contingents, do you want a full-time position? Um, overwhelmingly, the answer is yes. 28% um, said no. We understand that not every um, uh, part-timer wants a full-time position. We want to make this a possibility though. 60% said yes and 12% and, uh, said other. I've read all the comments there. You know, a lot of times that other is yes, but under certain circumstances. I wouldn't want to have to compete for it in these ways and, and so forth. But overwhelmingly, about two-thirds of our contingents say that they want a full-time appointment. And so, you know, being able to put together a pathway from part-time to full-time appointments would be an enormous gain. We asked our part-time academic contingents to rank um, among all these which are priorities to select their top two. And for part-time contingents, raising per course minima salary rose to the top. It was, it was by far the clearest choice. Um, when you look at pathways to permanency and longer term appointments, those are both job security issues. Um, those come, come somewhat close as a second, but even then they're, they're notably behind. But also getting, getting um, compensation for office hours, course prep and so forth, protecting access to health benefits. These things are all key issues um, for part-timers and, and you know, uh, re reflected in, in their responses. We put the question sort of bluntly um, to our part-time contingents. We said, um, would you rather have more money or more job security? Which is more important, increases in compensation, the per course minima, or increases in job security through longer term appointments, pathways to permanency, evergreen contracts, and so forth. And it's about a, it's about an even split, a little bit, a little bit more of a focus on compensation, but a, but a key focus. And, and obviously going into negotiations, both of these tracks are going to be essential for us. We asked the same question to our full-time academic contingents, and the answer here is a little bit different. About two-thirds of the full-timers um, prioritize job security, so long-term appointments, um, pathways to permanence, over raises in compensation. Again, this is not an either-or situation. We're going to be pushing for both, but just a way to get a sense of priorities. We asked our full-time academics, do you want a tenure track? appointment? Would you prefer to have a tenure track appointment? And again, overwhelmingly, the answer is yes. A little bit less than 20% said no. Um, again, the others here are very much along the lines of absolutely, but not if I had to do a national search, not if I was um, uh, had to be put um, into the same research obligations as the um, current tenure track faculty in my department and so forth. But, um, but the, the broad sentiment here, it's about you know, four fifths of the, um, of the respondents who are full-time contingents want that tenure line, want permanency. This has to be um, a key goal. Professionals are a different set of questions. Um, and the issue that has arisen to the absolute top four professionals in, in um, many cases is telecommuting. So uh, especially our non-health science center campuses, um, a majority of professionals rank it as among the top two non-compensation priorities. You remember the other, the other one was uh, keeping health benefits costs in check. So this was the other issue that rose to the top of that, um, uh, that question. And again, we heard strong vocal support consistently in all of our town hall sessions, in emails, in survey responses. A lot of our professionals are very much focused on work from remote. And so this is going to be a key, a key issue to uh, work out in, in 
the, the upcoming round. Three priorities emerged at the top for telecommuting. One was about work-life balance, and you're going to see an, an ongoing consistent emphasis on childcare concerns, work-life balance throughout a lot of the proposals. Um, people want the cap lifted from its current five-day max to a higher number of days that, that employees could work. That's five days out of, out of 10, it's 50%. Um, and, and in particular, people were concerned to address what they considered to be um, excessive amounts of documentation, tracking every um, uh, deliverable and, and product of work that, that's not necessary for in-person in work, but all of a sudden has become uh, necessary for, for remote work. And people want to be treated like professionals who do their job and are expected to do their job and, and not have to document every piece. So these are a couple of the, um, of the particular aspects of telecommuting that we're looking at. But we've gotten exceptionally good, thorough feedback from our professionals about what they want to see in a telecommuting agreement. And so we're absolutely going to be trying to address that in a lot of ways. A lot of ways. How much remote, remote work do people want? This is this is an interesting slide. So this is about telecommuting preferences among professionals who are not currently telecommuting. They have not been approved to telecommute, right? And so you see a breakdown of the HSC professionals and the non-HSC professionals. On the HSC professionals, again, more than 50% of the people who are not telecommuting would like to be telecommuting. So that means in addition to all those who are telecommuting, more than 50% would like to be telecommuting um, in addition, right? It's even higher on the um, non-HSC campuses, our, our traditional academic campuses. There, only 22% say they don't want to telecommute. That means 78% of the, of the faculty who are not telecommuting would like to be. And you'll see here, not all of them want to be telecommuting all the time. They want a, a range of different options. But this is going to be a key to thinking about how we negotiate a flexible arrangement that works for all of our, our, our members. Um, Continuing on this line about people who are not telecommuting. In the fall, um, a majority of the people who were not telecommuting told us that they would prefer to be telecommuting. That's both HSC and especially non-HSC. Um, but this is interesting. Many of the professionals who responded say they wanted to telecommute, but they haven't applied. Um, and among those, a large number of people have indicated that they have had someone on their campuses, a supervisor, a colleague, an administrator, someone attempting to discourage or dissuade them from even applying, right? Um, and so that kind of chilling uh, effect we know is, is taking place on campuses. And what we also know is that the telecommuting experience is very different on different campuses. Some campuses have embraced it, have really tried to set up liberal telecommuting agreements, and other campuses have been far are more reluctant to do so. And even within campuses, there are considerable differences between units. So this is one of the challenges that we've got to face as we go forward is thinking about how we can um, put some guidelines together that allow our members who want to be able to work remotely to have that opportunity and have some consistency across the system and across campuses and how it's, how it's um, implemented. Our hospital and HSC um, employees have spent the last few years really in the brunt of a pandemic. They are in many cases working incredibly short staffed. They have um, had, you know, life threatening health and safety concerns. Um, and they're seeing their colleagues leaving the university system for other jobs that that pay better or that have more flexibility and so forth. We, we know we have a range of, of issues that don't only affect hospitals, but that disproportionately affect our hospital and health science center um, members. And so we're going to make sure to try to, to make some gains here. A couple of, of things that have arisen consistently to the top of the member feedback. Um, getting additional support for certification and advanced degrees. We have a CLEFR program. We'd like to expand that to include not only initial certifications, but follow-up certifications. Um, we know permanency is crucial for um, our, our HSC members. We have had particular concerns about abuse of um, part-time temp lines, um, which we want to take on, not just part-time, but, but temp lines uh, in both part and full-time. Um, we want to take that on in this round. Um, getting some compensation for shift differentials for evening, night, and weekend shifts. Um, hazard pay, 
for people who are in direct patient care. You know, that's been part of the uh, legislative push. It's also part of our, our contract push. We were able to um, introduce a holiday pay as opposed to comp time provision in the last round, but it only applies to three holidays. So people want to expand that, that program. And then expanding the on-call recall rates and, and eligibility. This applies to more than our hospitals, but it has a particular effect on our, on our hospitals and HSCs. A few other things rise um, consistently among, among our HSC respondents. Um, SUNY tuition benefits, uh, this is consistent across the unit, it highlighted by our, our HSCs here. Um, support for research uh, conference, scholarship attendance. You'll see that academics a little bit more um, disproportionately want this, but, but professionals want it too, majority of professionals. Um, we talked about uh, new and, and renewal licensure um, certification, CLEFR program issues, um, professional development fundings, holiday pay here. Um, the holiday pay issue seems to be more important for our professionals, but again, a majority of academics on our health science center. So, you know, these are areas um, that we know we want to concentrate for those employees. Here's an illustration of one issue that affects only a portion of the unit. Um, this is about differential pay for downstate, midstate adjustment, right? Um, there are a few chapters, Maritime, Purchase, Optometry, Old Westbury, Stony Brook, Stony Brook HSC, Downstate, Farmingdale, New Paltz, that have full-time members who are eligible for this pay. And overwhelmingly, members on those campuses support increasing that pay. And, and I, I misspoke there. New Paltz does not currently um, get that downstate differential, but has for many, many years argued that there needs to be um, an expanded geographical range to include Ulster County. Um, and so, you know, that that is a, a key issue. A hundred percent of maritime respondents uh, indicated that differential pay was important um, as you know 70 percent or more on all the other on all the other campuses for those campuses who don't get this downstate or mid-state differential it's a low priority 13 to 35 percent of those other campuses right this is a place where we see a particular portion of our membership has a pressing need the cost of living in the downstate and mid-state areas are astronomically higher than they are upstate and, and in other parts of, of our um, bargaining unit. And, and our members have indicated how pressing this is. And it's about 36% of our bargaining unit um, works at these campuses, right? So it's a big portion of our unit. I think it's more than a lot of the other units in the state. This is gonna be a priority because it matters so much for that portion of our membership. A few other things rise to the top. Um, Paid family leave, expanding those benefits was, was a priority across all the categories. Um, HSC academics, HSC professionals, non-HSC academics, non-HSC professionals. Uh, maintaining and expanding our paid family leave is a, is a, is a real priority. Um, green initiatives has a lot of support, which is great. Um, we think that that includes telecommuting, absolutely. We also think that, um, you know, are interested in, in some proposals around uh, electric car chargers on parking lots that are owned by campuses, um, some sustainability committees, some tax um, uh, free uh, programs of various court sorts. Um, the green initiatives are a major part of our legislative agenda, absolutely. We're gonna find ways wherever we can to incorporate this into our contract. And I think you know, telecommuting is another one. People are, are thinking of telecommuting in, in one of its benefits uh, are in its environmental sustainability benefits. And so we're, 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 we're gonna be pursuing that in relationship to green initiatives as well. Professional development opportunities, you know, child care, elder care, disabled care, dependent care. Um, these uh, issues come up throughout. It's a strong strand of our survey comments are, are about the crisis of child care. So we're going to do whatever we can to try to find places in our contract, for instance, um, expanding DCAA accounts and so forth to, to help um, the, the employer contribution to those DCAA accounts to help uh, make some gains there. SUNY tuition benefits comes up um, a, a lot. You know, we're talking about here for benefits for employees. 
through the space available program, which could be expanded or, or you know, SUNY tuition could be covered more broadly and for dependents, right? So we have a, a SUNY scholarship for dependents now, but finding ways to expand that support so that employees, dependents have access to SUNY tuition uh, remuneration. I think that's important. Um, uh, Research support of various kinds is important, um, and and re recruitment retention of a of a diverse faculty gets a lot of support. You know, again, well over a majority of people are are listing this as as a as a priority, and we're going to try wherever we can in the contract to make some gains there. This could be around expanding the Drescher um, uh, program, which is um, a program for pre tenure. Uh, faculty of of color and and women. Um, there are other kinds of joint labor management programs and so forth where we can maybe try to find ways to help bolster this goal of recruiting and retaining um, a, a racially and and gendered and nationally diverse um, group of faculty. There are a few constituents that have um, arisen with a particular set of needs. Uh, that have been clearly articulated in the member feedback. There's a lot of these, and, and I, I give these three as examples, not as a full list, right? But librarians have made very, very clear their needs, particularly around protected time. That's going to be important. Our housing professionals in Res Life have made a lot of um, important um, needs known about their work in direct um, care with, um, with housing, uh, around permanency, around a range of other issues um, that they're tasked with. That's going to be important. Our residents and fellows at the hospitals and health science centers have pointed to some disparities between their um, compensation and benefits and, and fellows at other, at other institutions. We're going to see if we can make some gains there. They're an important constituency that we want to try to be intentional about including in this round. So let me go back to our um, my point initially, that uh, we know when we go to the table, we are bargaining for all 37,000 members. Um, we have to get a contract that works for everybody. And so in some ways, that's about a broad overview, um, issues where there's consensus, health benefits, compensation, absolutely. But we also go to the table thinking we need to achieve a balanced deal, a deal that meets the pressing needs of our members where they are. Professionals have different needs than academics. And so telecommuting, for instance, not only, but for instance, rises um, to the top. Um, contingents have particular needs around job security or compensation and other things. Our hospitals and health sciences have particular needs. Our residents, our librarians, our residential life people have particular needs. Our downstate members have particular needs. A good contract is one that meets these key priorities for the sub you know, constituents within our unit. When we're giving feedback as members, we're doing it individually. When we turn to bargaining for a contract and organizing around a contract, it's the moment when we need to put our collective voices, 37,000 voices, to fight for needs of members who are not identical to our own. This is an opportunity for us to bargain in solidarity with all of our members. Academics need to be fighting for professionals. We need to be fighting for telecommunity because it matters to our professionals. Our contingents need to be fighting for our health science centers because they need additional support. All of us need to be fighting for our contingent faculty. Even if we're not contingent, we need to be fighting for those contingent faculty because their working conditions are um, uh, you know, in, enormously distressing and because they play an essential role in the, in the university and the crisis of contingency undermines the academic mission of, of the university. These are just a few of the many reasons that we now turn to work together as a union to fight for all of our pressing needs. And so when we go to the table, we're taking this member feedback to heart. Absolutely, it's been enormously valuable and we continue to get it. But we're gonna move now to putting together our proposals. And when we put together our conceptual proposals to get to the bargaining with the state, we're gonna be trying to set up um, a, a, a set of issues that can get us to what looks like a balanced deal, one that works for all of our members, one that takes into account the particular needs of um, those who are most vulnerable, those who are who are most oppressed in our in our membership, uh, minority populations of various sorts, um, and asserts a, a you know a, a underlying principle of solidarity as we bargain together. 
Um, that's where we are in the process. We have um, been meeting regularly as a negotiations team now or putting together contract proposals. It's our hope that we will have those ready to be able to um, have them approved by our negotiations committees late in the spring and get to the table with the state as soon as we can. We will certainly be giving updates as regularly as, um, as possible and we'll let you know as any developments take place. Thanks a million for listening. Appreciate your time. And especially we appreciate your engagement throughout this process. We want to have 37,000 members working together, bargaining together, um, you know, organizing together to get the best possible contract we can. So work with your chapters, um, you know, stay, stay in touch with us. And uh, we look forward to, um, to working together to get the best contract possible. Thank you very much.